true. Last night uh, I was watching a, a live broadcast uh, over Facebook of uh, Quote the Raven, uh, a, a brilliant, uh, let's call them folk duo uh, out east. Uh, they were Facebooking uh, live uh, last night because they just can't go out and perform. And that's something that we're going to be talking about at the top of the hour, going out to the East Coast as well, when Christina Martin is going to be joining us and how the music industry has really been hit hard by this, as every industry certainly has. Well, he's the first North American to be awarded a master's degree in risk, crisis, and disaster management from the only university in the world to offer such program in the UK. And he's the author of more than 200 articles and 11 books. Several are used as texts at leading universities in the UK and Canada, Safer Cities of the Future and uh, his latest Cyber City Safe. They deal with the security and sustainability in, c- in cities. Uh, Alan Bonner joins us on Canada Now. And Alan, the entire globe, <clears throat> excuse me, of course, is, uh, is talking about de- and dealing with uh, the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, that throw clear would not indicate that I do have something. Uh, but are you are you shaking your head at how we could have handled all this a bit better? Well, yes, I am. And uh, as you may know, I'm about a block and a half away from you, and it's because of your throat clearing I didn't come over and sit in the <laughs> studio with you. Um, but I have an extra mic. It's ready. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know who used it before uh, me. Uh, <laughs> There is a concept that has been around for 40 years in crisis management, and it's called get big quickly. If you send two fire trucks to a fire and you only need one, it's no problem. They turn around and go home. If you send one and you needed two, that's a big problem. There is a concept in the military. Two is one, one is none. If you only have two of, if you have two of something and one breaks, you can still use the spare. But if you only have one, you can't do anything. We didn't react as quickly as we should have to this, and uh, I think that that's uh, really obvious. Then the next thing that makes me shake my head is the crowded conditions at O'Hare Airport and other airports. I think there are 13 airports in America where you can screen people. We could have opened up Mirabelle Airport. There were 7,000 small airports in America. Uh, We could have used smaller planes. You could uh, put the seats farther apart in planes. When you land at O'Hare, you could have used a bus to go into a motel or hotel and get screened there. Uh, I just didn't see any operational manifestation of the fact that we are in this crisis. What about um, private citizens? And, and while I don't entirely point the finger at them, uh, the uh, the lack of education to them, uh, you know, because, you know, for me, being in the line of work that, that I'm in, Alan, I, I'm on top of the news. I'm at least I try to be. I, I read as much as I can. Uh, and, and this has obviously been a, a topic on the show to varying degrees for a number of uh, number of days, number of weeks, a number of of months. My wife is, is kind of in the same boat where she has really had to pay attention to this. But a lot of people are just going about their daily lives and hearing about this. You know, they get warned once, they get warned twice, they go, ah, eh, it, it, it's I'm sure this will blow over. What about the education of the public? Could a, a, a better job have been done? to really bring to light the seriousness of of what this was going to be? Well, number one, this is a democracy, and you can't make people do certain things. You can encourage them, cajole them, and you can create curfews, but ultimately, uh, you know, we have the burden of a democracy. One of the things I'll uh, cite is that in an evacuation order, even if you say you will die if you do not leave this building or neighborhood, You don't get 100 percent compliance with an evacuation order. Some people uh, may remember the uh, older gentleman who lived at Mount St. Ellen's when it erupted and he wouldn't leave and and he died. There are hurricane parties in uh, Florida uh, during hurricane season. Uh, The University of Waterloo right now is trying to convince young people who know they're in the least vulnerable category, to not go out to the St. Patrick's Day street parties at which there are always injuries and hospitalizations and so on. And now with coughing and sneezing and what have you, uh, it's even more dangerous. So, uh, you know, people will uh, get informed about what they want to get informed about. And, uh, you know, a lot of people still probably don't know that this is 
uh, as serious as it is. They have a language difficulty. They're working shift work. They're just not plugged in. That's one issue. The other issue is the communication from the authorities. I've been reading uh, the emails from the universities that I'm associated with, and they start out with paragraphs of bloviation, creative writing, and nonsense. The kind of thing like this that you would throw in the garbage if it were a press release. As we look across the world and examine the global situation and monitor it and have our pandemic planning committee report back, and the Senate is ratifying this, and the Board of uh, Governors is also involved, and on and on it goes, and it's in paragraph three that it says, the school is closed, do not come here, do not uh, come to residence. Now, that's what you would call in your business burying the lead. We've got to get on with telling people what the facts are. I had a hotel chain, high-end hotel chain I stay uh, in a lot, and they did what I call an, a, a self-centered message. In our 100-year history, we have always striven to do the best we can do for our customers and our staff, and this goes back to our founders' gu- guiding principles. Nonsense, bloviation, this is creative writing in lieu of communication. If the hotel is closed, if you uh, have to check in in a certain uh, way or don't check in at all, you've got to get on with saying it. So, so some of the communication I'm seeing is incompetent, and many of the people who should be more informed are, are at a significant risk. So those are the two ends of the spectrum, and I hope that made sense. You know, it does. Um, a pandemic, Alan, seems to crop up I don't know, again, to varying degrees, uh, about every decade uh, or so. Uh, why aren't we better at this? Um, are, are we, like, does it need to get this bad so that it can be in, in our memory so that we can be better uh, seemingly a, a decade from now? Uh, is, it, is it government? Is it politicians that in coming out of something like this, just going, well, it's over, it, it's it's really not on uh, the top of voters' minds uh, to to prepare for what's going to happen when I'm not in leadership. So why even bother going ahead and, and, and moving forward with with uh, whatever plan that that I, that I could have here? Yeah, you, you've hit an important couple of reasons. The politician who spends some money today on flood control or food safety, which Bill Clinton did when he was president, uh, or on pandemic planning or vaccinations or... Um, elderly homes isn't going to reap a reward for that. It's going to come through the system in five, eight, ten years, and it's going to be some other politician, maybe with a different party, that gets the credit. So it's very rare that a politician would do that. One of the great cases is Duff's Ditch. Uh, Premier uh, Duff Roblin of Manitoba did a floodway that has paid for itself many, many times over. But, you know, you don't really... uh, That's not high on the agenda for a politician. The other thing is, statistically, I could say to you, you are not likely to get this so you can relax. And statistically, that's true. I mean, even if the World Health Organization's prediction from about a dozen years ago that 350 million people could die in a future pandemic, uh, even if that's true, you yourself are probably statistically likely to live, so you'll say, well, you know, life is going to go on. So th- there are a lot of reasons why we have such a short uh, memory of this stuff. I lived through the Hong Kong flu in 1968, so I have some immunity. I lived through the swine flu in which the vaccine killed more people than the, the flu and SARS, you know, but, but corporate memory is short. It really is. Do we have the means, Alan, uh, to, to really come out of this better prepared for the next time something like this happens? Well, yes, we do. But as, as Winston Churchill said, uh, sometimes people stumble across the truth, but usually they just get themselves up, dust themselves off and stagger on as before. I mean, <laughs> how is it? Th- th- think of uh, how, how densely populated America is. 350 million people. Uh, they one thing they do do well is they feed everybody. I mean, it's not very good food, but you are not very far away from a fast food restaurant in America and you can get food. Not so in, in the old Soviet Union, and, I, and I've been there. Uh, uh, and George Kohan, the head of McDonald's Canada, was the one who led the, uh, the push to get McDonald's into 
uh, Russia. The point I'm making is that if America can feed itself and much of the world uh, with fast food and, and very few lineups and so on, how is it that we're just discovering drive-in swabs and testing and drive-in uh, medical care? They're pretty good using their pharmacies uh, as a place where you can get a flu shot, and they were ahead of us on that. But we should be able to test tens of millions of people uh, darn near over a weekend in a Walmart parking lot uh, if we get our act together. It'll, it'll remain to be seen if we do, but that's how we could really come out of this stronger. Mm. Well, uh, you mentioned food. Do we need to rethink how we prepare food? Absolutely. Um, there are surrogate issues. Uh, if you happen to be fit, uh, and uh, exercise on a daily basis, and your diet's pretty good, and you don't smoke, and you have to run for a bus, uh, you're not likely to injure yourself running for the bus. But if you're not generally fit, a specific risk can have its way with you. So 40, 50,000 people die from regular flu About in America. About 4,000 people die from food poisoning. And those things are often misdiagnosed. You know, frankly, an, an elderly person in an old folks' home who is uh, not ambulatory anymore, suffering in bed, suddenly dies. Was it food poisoning? Was it the flu? Was it just old age? Well, who knows? We move on. Bill Clinton invested some in, in food safety because it, with 4,000 people are dying, that's worth looking at. Cleanliness is its own reward. If you buy clean food, uh, prepare it in a clean way, not, not just cleaning, but then sanitizing, and eat healthy food, you are way better off. If we had you know, doubled and tripled and quadrupled our efforts on just food safety, sanitation, and influenza, this event would be uh, far less worrisome. Mm. Sanitation. Do we need to rethink how our sanitation works and to make sure that we all have a proper system in place? Well, sure. Go to the coffee room. Uh, take a look at your favorite mug. When was the last time it was through the dishwasher or did you just rinse it out and, and put it upside down? Uh, yeah, we've, we've got to think about what we do there. We've got to think this handshaking is uh, to, to use a technical term. Stand by. Handshaking is nuts. Uh, you know, when my dentist goes to shake my hand, I said, what, are you trying to kill me? You know, knock it off. In, in, in British hospitals, the dirtiest thing they could find in British hospitals were physicians' ties and their pagers or handheld phones. Mm. And those things need to be cleaned. I, I put my phone, it's up to my ear right now, of course, uh, but I put my phone in a sonic, uh, ultrasonic cleaner, uh, you know, about every day now. And I put my toothbrushes in there and I put my uh, keys. Keys are really dirty. So, yeah, we, we got to, you know, we, we don't need to go crazy, but we need to think of these things as uh, potential transmission devices. Well, but, you know, if, if we clean those things and, and it becomes uh, habitual, then it, it's not going to be a problem down the road. Go to alanbonner.com. Alan, I really appreciate your, your insight on all of this. We'd love to reconnect uh, sometime down the road. Uh, and, and I don't know how far along this is going to be. Um, I don't know. Maybe you have an estimated guess as, as to how long we're going to be uh, living, you know, some in, 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 in isolation. When do we get to, quote, uh, quote unquote, normal uh, again? Uh, no, normal won't be till next winter because it could uh, it will dissipate over the warm weather. And just like the Spanish flu, it, it will probably come back in the fall. So this is going to be uh, longer than uh, I think people are predicting. We've got to get into telecommuting. We've got to change the way we live. And uh, for those who want to drown their sorrows, don't forget to wash the lemon in hot, soapy water before you make a martini, uh, just in case that lemon has been handled by a lot of different people. Well, I'm definitely going to need that tip uh, for later on. Alan Bonner, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Stay safe. You too.